I talked quite a bit about the total economic impact of climate change. Now let's have a look at the margin at the so-called social cost of carbon. Here are our 27 estimates uh, of the total economic impact again. These estimates are irrelevant for policy. Why? If you want to calculate optimal climate policy, if you want to maximize welfare, then what you do is you write down the first order condition of optimality, and they contain a first partial derivative. They do not contain the total, they contain uh, the marginal. Uh, intuitively, if you're in charge of a small country or a medium-sized country or even a large country in between two elections for five years, then you cannot take away all of climate change. But you can only take away a little bit of climate change. So you're not interested in the total impact, you're interested in what happens incrementally, what happens at uh, <coughs> the margin. The marginal damage cost or the social cost of carbon uh, is defined as the damage done if you emit an additional ton of CO2. Um, and technically what you do is you take a scenario of greenhouse gas emissions and with that comes the scenario of concentrations and climate change and along that scenario of climate change you compute the impact of climate change. That is the first thing you do. Then you take the same emission scenarios but you add a, some uh, additional CO2 to it. Then you calculate the new concentration that follows, the new climate change that follows and the new impact of climate change that follows. Uh, and then you take the difference between your original scenario, the impact in your original scenario, and the impact in your perturbed scenario, and you have a stream of incremental impacts, and you discount that back to today, and then you normalize that by your change in emissions, and that is your uh, estimate of the marginal uh, impact. If you do this along an optimal emission trajectory, then you have calculated the PQ tax, the tax that you would want to impose on uh, CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions if your aim is to maximize uh, welfare. And the PQ tax and the social cost of carbon is very much a normative uh, concept. It tells us what to do. Now, given the centrality of the social cost of carbon in policy debates, it should not surprise you that there have been many estimates uh, of this quantity. Uh, in fact, there have been well over 1,300 uh, of these uh, estimates, and that means uh, that we can do fancy uh, statistical things, as you see here, where a kernel density uh, was estimated. <coughs> now, wait a second. There are 27 estimates of the total cost of climate change, but more than 1,300 of its first partial derivative. That means that people can't take a first partial derivative because if you have 27 totals, then you should have 27 marginals, right? No. Uh, that would be uh, incorrect. The um, estimates that have shown, the 27 estimates that have shown of the total cost of climate change are point estimates. And what you need is not just the impact of climate change at 2.5 degrees of warming and it or at 3 degrees of warming, no, you need to know the impacts of climate change at 2.5 degrees of warming and 3 degrees of warming and 3.5 and 1.5 and half and half a degree of warming. You need to know the impact curve. Um, and a point estimate only gives you one point on that curve, and reasonable, reasonable people can reasonably disagree about what the shape uh, of that impact curve uh, is. Uh, so that is the first complication that you introduce. Uh, second, uh, what you need is also a model that translates emissions into concentrations. And there are many alternative models of the carbon cycle. Uh, you also need a model that translates concentrations of greenhouse gases into radiative forcing and there, uh, from there into uh, climate change. And again, there are many different ways of doing so, different parameterizations uh, of calculating that. So that introduces a lot of additional degrees of freedom, uh, but there's more uh, because scenarios uh, also matter. Uh, if you start with a scenario of high emissions, you have a lot of climate change and therefore a lot of 
damages from climate change, but you also have a lot of incremental damages. You also have high marginal damages of climate change. Whereas if you start with low emission scenarios, um, you end up in a lower socioeconomic climate. Uh, and it's not just emissions that matter here, but of course those impacts fall on people, so number of people matters, as well as how rich those people are and matters there too. Uh, so you have um, many more degrees of freedom there. And then finally, um, the social cost of carbon is a net present value. It is an aggregate over a stream of incremental uh, impact discounted to today. So your choice of discount rate matters, uh, but also does impact fall on people across the world. So it also matters how you aggregate over people, how you aggregate across countries. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of uncertainty about the future. So also you would want to have a lot of alternative futures in your model. And then somehow you need to aggregate or average across those uh, scenarios. Um, so this introduces a lot of additional degrees of freedom, and that explains why there can be 27 estimates of the total and more than 1,300 of uh, the marginal. And in fact, uh, a number of 27 estimates of the total have not been used as a basis to calculate uh, the marginals. Uh, so that explains why there are so many. The good thing is then, as I said, that you can do fancy statistical things like uh, estimate a kernel uh, density. Uh, and that is what we see here, and that's done conditional on the discount rate that is used. Uh, the PRTP is the pure rate of time preference, that's a utility discount rate. The consumption discount rate is just 2 plus for the pure rate of time preference. Um, and what you see is uh, that the discount rate matters. Uh, but what you also see um, is that the uncertainty is right skewed. Uh, just, just as with the totals, we have that the marginals are right skewed. That is, the right tail is much better than the left uh, tail, or negative surprises are more likely uh, than positive surprises. Uh, so that is the first thing you notice. And the second thing you notice is that the discount rate matters quite a bit. And that is intuitive. The discount rate is essentially how much emphasis we place on the future. And the more you care about the future, the more you care about climate change, and the higher your social cost of carbon uh, would be. And that is exactly what you see happening here. Um, that's perhaps clearer if you just focus on the mode and the mean. For a 3% pure rate of time preference, a 5% discount rate, you have a mode of $28 per ton of carbon. And that goes up to 100. If the discount rate goes to 1%, goes up to uh, 202. If the discount rate, the utility discount rate, goes to zero, uh, so that is the mode, the best guess. Uh, I said that the uncertainty is uh, right skewed, um, and that implies that the mean is greater than the mode, and that is exactly what you see happening. But again, it increases for lower discount rates. Now, the other thing that you noticed in the PDFs is that they lower the discount rate. The PDF sort of lacks definition for a high discount rate. We see a PDF, starts low, it goes up, it goes down, that's it. Uh, but uh, for low discount rates, there doesn't seem to be much of an ordinary bell-shaped uh, type of uh, relationship. The discount rate doesn't just uh, discount future impacts, it also discounts uncertainty. Uh, and the reason for this is fairly straightforward. Uh, the further out in the future you go, the greater the uncertainty becomes. You have a reasonable idea of what's going to happen this afternoon and next week, good idea of what's going to happen in a year's time and maybe in 10 years' time. But if you're interested in climate change, then what you need to know is also what's going to happen in 50 years' time and in 100 years' time. And the further out you look, the greater uh, the uncertainty uh, about what things will look like. Now, if you use a 3% pure rate of time preference, then essentially everything that happens after 100 years is heavily discounted. And that includes the wide range of uncertainties about what the world will be like um, in the year 2120. 
if you use a lower discount rate, you need to look further into the future. <coughs> if if you're with uh, Lord Stern and you advocate uh, a pure rate of time preference of 0.1% uh, per year, then actually what happens in 12,000 years from now still affects your estimate uh, of uh, the social cost of carbon. And 12,000 years from now is a long time time into the future, 12,000 years ago, we were all still hunter-gatherers. Um, and that explains why uh, the uncertainty uh, grows large, uh, grows larger uh, if you use a lower pure rate of time preference. Uh, and that explains why the PDF loses definition. Essentially, uh, can't say much, the distribution becomes almost uh, uniform. For comparison, I also put up the um, for comparison, I also put up the price of carbon in three major emission trading systems. That is the uh, European Union, that's California, and that's Shenzhen in China. And what you see is that the revealed preference, the actual price of carbon, is towards the low end of the estimated social cost of carbon, or perhaps it is towards the high end of what people would deem to be a reasonable uh, discount rate. Um, final thing I want to say about the social cost of carbon, this is the social cost of carbon at a particular point in time. It changes from year to year. Uh, and here we see another kernel density. This is um, a kernel density of the estimates of the growth rate of the social cost of carbon. And the best guess here, uh, as you see, is that the social cost of carbon should increase by some 2% uh, per year. Uh, so if your best guess at the moment uh, is, is 100, um, is 100, and then next year it should be 102, and the year after it should be 104, and so on, uh, and so forth.